Welcome to the Business Feed. I'm Steve D'Agostino. I'll talk with Dean Roars of Rotary International about the centennial of the Rotary Foundation on the Business Feed on 90.5 WICN, Jazz Plus for New England, and streaming at WICN.org. My guest is Dean Roars, a director of Rotary International. Dean and her husband, Rhino Roars, and their three children emigrated 26 years ago from South Africa to Canada. She grew up in Zambia and, after marrying Rhino, lived in Malawi, Namibia, and South Africa. Dean was born into a Rotary family and, when Rhino joined Rotary in 1986, became an active Rotary Anne, that's what they called women in Rotary, until she was allowed to, as with many other women, to join Rotary itself as a Rotarian in 1989. That was two years after women were finally allowed to be admitted as members of Rotary Clubs, thanks to a U.S. Supreme Court ruling. On arriving in Vancouver, both uh, Dean and Rhino joined the Rotary Club of West Vancouver. At present, they're members of the Rotary Club of Langley Central. Dean has had a varied career, ranging from the early days of being an operating room nurse on Professor Christian Barnard's first heart transplant team to running a nursery school in Malawi. She and Rhino now own and manage a company that is involved in soil stabilization during road construction. Dean's best experience is leading teams of Rotarians, rotor actors, those are younger uh, people who uh, are in training to become hopefully one day Rotarians, and interactors, high school students uh, who are also uh, getting ready to become hopefully one day Rotarians and uh, leading teams of them in uh, to Africa. She loves seeing how this volunteer experience changes their lives. Dean, welcome to the business beat and welcome to Worcester. Well, thank you very much for having me. What are the vision and the mission of the Rotary Foundation? Let's start with the mission first and then maybe we can talk about three, five years out. What's the vision that Rotary International and the Foundation have for themselves? Well, the mission is to do good in the world, be it whatever the good is that needs to be done. Uh, we reach out into more than 200 countries and districts all over the world, and really we fulfill a need, be it the humanitarian work, be, be it within education, be it within health, um, whichever area where there is a need. And one of the key efforts is ending polio now, and I believe there are only two countries left on the entire planet where there are still cases of, road, of polio, um, and the hope is to stamp that out in those two countries and not have it erupt in any other countries uh, over the next, uh, what, year or two or so? Yeah, we're really, really proud that at this particular stage we've only had two cases of polio. Oh, two cases of polio in Pakistan, and three cases of polio in, IG, in, in, in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and that is since the beginning of this particular year. So only five cases of polio, and the last case took place in February. We have had not a single case diagnosed since February. Um, polio was uh, found to have surged up again in Nigeria last year, but again there have been no notified cases of polio in Nigeria since about um, August to September of last year, so consequently we are feeling that Nigeria doesn't have active polio at this particular time. Of course, once we have a full year clear of no polio cases, there are still another two years that have to be gone. You still have to immunize constantly for another two years. And even after that, it can still erupt again. Well, technically, if we have had no cases of polio identified, if all the samples in all the sewage systems and all the tracking over those three years start showing negative, negative, negative results, and they don't have any positive incidences of polio, then technically the only places that the polio virus should be alive is in laboratories, in test tubes, which are kept for records for prosperity, I think they do. But uh, no, it's three years after the last case of polio, then the world should be declared polio-free. Now, when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s, uh, I knew people who had, including a relative of mine, polio, and it wasn't an epidemic, but it was pretty wide, well-known as a disease. 
today, I don't think most people in America or Canada or most other uh, advanced countries know what polio is, do they? No, and it's quite heartbreaking sometimes because when I speak to the youth and I say to them, well, tell me about polio, they'll say to me, what do you mean, what's polio? And somebody might raise a hand and so say, oh, I think it's a disease or something. But really, polio hasn't been seen here in North America since the 60s and early 70s. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's something which we just don't live with. But if you go to the countries, if you go to the third world countries, go anywhere in Africa and you'll find all these crawlers everywhere. Go to India and you'll see the results. Because India was only declared polio three, three, three years ago. And especially go to Pakistan, where I've just returned from Pakistan, and to see the people still crawling all over and the debilitation of active polio, it's absolutely heartbreaking. Remembering that polio really does affect the, only the very, very small, under five years old. And to see a little child that you know is going to be paralyzed for life, or to see them that they cannot breathe and you know they're going to die because they cannot be looked after. They don't have the medical systems that we had when we, we had those kind of epidemics. It really is it's an absolute tragedy. It's something that we have to finish. It's a fight that must be completed. That said, do we need a new cause, that is Rotary and the Rotary Foundation, uh, especially for millennials, uh, now that so the end polio now campaign may be wrapping up at least as a global campaign in the next few years? Or will it? Um, I think Rotary is not going to even look at what the next campaign would be, or even if there is a campaign. Mm -hmm. I think they're putting into place, or I know they are putting into place, a committee to study this. How about just end poverty now? No, if only that was that simple. Unfortunately, ending poverty has a lot to do with politics. And if How about ending politics now? Oh, that I would give. I would give anything, anything. If we can get rid of politics and ego out of this world, I think we would conquer the world. Well, there's the new so, campaign. Yeah, yeah, there it is, the new com campaign. Let's get rid of politics and ego. But no, at this, I, you know, things have come up. Um, suggestions have been made. How about eradicate malaria or let's bring clean water to everybody. I think these are attainable. So it's going to be once polio is done, then we will look. But I think we'll probably be ready with a campaign which has been agreed upon and that others can buy into and that have a passion for. And of course you have Bill Gates, one of the founders of Microsoft, who's now off with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation doing wonderful things around the world. And he is a Rotarian. And I believe he became one because his dad was a Rotarian. Correct. And he's also out doing philanthropy now because his dad took him out to the woodshed and said, get you, out there and do a you, philanthropy, you stop playing with software. You've got it. You've got it. Yes, we're very fortunate to have this partnership, as we are very fortunate to be developing new partnerships with large, large organizations. You cannot work in isolation anymore. You cannot just be one organization. The polio success was because of partnerships with the CDC and the World Health Organization and UNICEF and, and the governments of the world. So in the same way, Bill and Melinda Gates have done amazing work in the funding that they have done and in the advocacy that they have done. And Warren Buffett for giving half of his wealth oh, to them for their foundation. Of course, it comes from many directions. You're listening to The Business Beat on 90.5 WICN, Jazz Plus 40 New England, and streaming at WICN.org. I'm Steve D'Agostino. I'm talking with Dean Roars of Rotary International about the centennial of the Rotary Foundation. So why was the Rotary Foundation founded 100 years ago in 1917 as World War I was raging? Well, there was a wonderful gentleman called Arch Clump. And at the end of the International Convention... And he was one of the founders of Rotary to begin with. Um, no, he joined Rotary oh, he did a while afterwards. later. Okay. He wasn't one of the original founders, but he was a member in the 1920s 1920s. when this was established. But uh, obviously in 1927. Right? right, as it's the 100th year, oh, 1970, 1970, 1970, as this was the 100th year right. um, anniversary. But Arch Klumpf came with a proposal that the profits from the International Convention should start a foundation to do good in the world. And it was a whole giant sum of 20, 
$26.50. And I think that if you uh, did inflation, it would be something like $2,000 now. Yes, yeah, something like that. But even that's still a paltry sum today. And it's what, you know, that, but, but it was a start. It was a start, but there was a lot of controversy about it. People why? didn't want to do that. They said, why, why should we do this? You know, why should we be starting a foundation? Well, today we have a foundation that's worth over a billion dollars in our annual fund, and we have a goal to make that $2 billion by 2020. Because and you're also one of the most well-regarded uh, charitable foundations on the absolutely. planet, as rated absolutely. by the different uh, Yes, if you, if you uh, go into the observers. website Charity Navigator and those, yes. you'll see that we have the highest possi possible rating. They don't only measure you on the fiduciary care stewardship of the funds, they also measure you, measure you on the results. But how healthy and sustainable, is it healthy exactly. and sustainable, not just a exactly. one-off that uh, disappears yeah. after a week or two or a year? So here we are a hundred years later. Let's talk in broad scope now, and then we'll get down into each of these issues. But overall, what has been the impact of the Rotary Foundation over that century in addressing the six areas of focus of the Rotary Foundation, which are peace and conflict, prevention and resolution, disease prevention and treatment, water and sanitation, maternal and child care, child health, basic education and literacy, and economic and community development. When you take all those together, we've got a healthy, sustainable plan. Have we made great progress in the last hundred years, or are we falling behind, or are we more or less maintaining the status quo? Well, I think we've made tremendous progress. I really do. Uh, Rotary is, as I've said, in more than 200 countries. It's. I wish we could really measure what the impact is, but this is something that Rotary has never actually done, because clubs are autonomous. Clubs go out there and they do good in the world. So how do we actually measure exactly what impact a club has where it's working? Well, you can, when, when you apply for a global grant, for instance, through Correct. the Rotary Foundation, there are measurements in there, and you, you don't just give them up. No. Um, you don't just to fill out within 25 words or less what you're going to do, and you get X thousands of dollars. You have to actually show metrics, don't you? Yes, we do, but that's the only area that we can measure. Okay. We cannot measure when a club goes directly, which I would say is So when a club itself uses its is, own funding right, and does it everything sends the a team of volunteers or, right. or, or just goes into an area and sees a need and does something about it. Um, slowly we are collecting that data. Slowly we have the technology to be able to start. What would you look for this? in a community? Um, would it be looking at it at the community-wide level or at the balance sheet of the club itself or some other kind of metric that's at the club level? Or do you look at the whole community and see what impact it's having on building a healthy, sustainable local community in that particular place? And I think you could measure it both ways, and that would be to the clubs need to come up and to really start entering the data. Right. We have been here, we have done that, it cost us this amount in dollar value, but it also cost this amount in volunteer hours. Nobody measures our volunteer hours, and I think those are almost uncountable the volume of time that people give. But then the second time, of course, obviously would be on the direct data, on the graft stuff that you have out there, that you can see the grants being applied, how much the grants are. We have district grants, we have global grants, you can measure those. You have the scholarships, you have the peace centers and the scholarships that are being done all over the world. That, that it's, it's a lot of money, it's a tremendous amount. It's billions of dollars that Rotary spends in communities on an annual basis if we were able to measure it and measure it accurately. Now I've been working for several years in what's called the healthy, sustainable capitalism movement, mm -hmm. which sometimes sounds like an oxymoron. But basically, you know, we've got the single bottom line of uh, bad capitalism, um, and that's the monetary profit. But if you, you can have people, planet, and profit, the three Ps, and they have to be in healthy balance or equitable balance. Otherwise, it's capitalist raping and pillaging people and planet to serve the bottom line, uh, the fiduciary responsibility bottom line for the shareholders. Um, do you see capitalism starting to move in that direction anywhere in the United States, Canada, anywhere on the planet? I think you'll see it anywhere in the world. You know, there is people, it's always the bottom line. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's where I am so proud about Rotary. 
because it's not the bottom line other than sustainability, the sustainability of a project and the teaching of a community to become self-sufficient. Well, what I'm wondering is, is that a way to measure Rotary's work? It's not only the financial bottom line of did you spend, That's what I'm talking but about. also yeah. the people yeah. and the planet. Is there a way to measure those two impacts? Um, Are there metrics I, for that? I don't know. I okay. honestly don't know. I, I, I wish there was. I, I cannot speak to that at all. I, you know, I can we'll have to start a contest. Oh yeah, that's a wonderful way of doing that metrics. for saying people, come on, come <laughs> right. and tell us how we can do this. Wouldn't that be amazing? Well, maybe there are more learned minds in Rotary International working on this already. And certainly I think they are trying to measure some of these things, but I don't know how you would actually measure Well, I think in you know, the energy and food and um, uh, transportation areas, there's a lot of that work going on, so it might be possible to... Uh, replicate, if not, you know, rather than reinventing the wheel, just oh, take sure. what they've yeah. done and see yeah, if it's able to be, able to be a transferred over to what Rotary's yeah. doing. You're listening to the Business Feed on 90.5 WICN, Jazz Plus for New England, and streaming at WICN.org. I'm Steve D'Agostino. I'm talking with Dean Roars of Rotary International, centennial of the Rotary Foundation. So we've got the six areas of focus, and the first one is peace and conflict prevention resolution. Why that? Well, the whole of Rotary's mission is doing good in the world. Mm -hmm. And how can you do, do good in the world if you don't bring peace to the world? So this is a program that built out of some of our scholarship programs, and it's been going for more than 20 years now, is the identifying of scholars and giving scholarships to those who are interested in developing postgraduate degrees in peace and conflict resolution. So we have um, more than a thousand graduates from this program at the moment. There are six universities that accept our scholars across the world, working specifically in this, in this, um, you know, in this media. Um, it's what are the name of the universities? Oh, you can. Oh, are, are they? Well, they, they not, it's, one, it's not one brand. They're actually no, six no, no, different no, no, universities. No, no, no. Six in different countries okay. in the world. So they they scattered all over. Right. Um, Duke is one of them here. Um, there is Bradford University in the UK, Uppsala in 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 Sweden. Right. So yeah, you know they're scattered all over the world. There's a short-term program as well, which comes out of Bangkok, but that is not a full year or two-year program, but a just a six uh, or a few month program. Um, the, the Peace Centers has been working on its own foundation as well to develop its own endowment fund so that they can fund more students than what we already are sending. This is the fellowship program? Um, is yes, fellowship? that's the fellowship program. Then, um, you know, if, if somebody wants to donate funds to the Rotary Foundation, they have the ability to donate and form an endowment fund mm -hmm. in the name of peace and conflict resolution in which they can fund their own scholars. So many of our scholars are funded through these kind of endowments as well. Now, we have the United Nations, obviously, that was formed oh, yes. in 1945, mm -hmm. and the Rotary International is one of the founding members and has a non-voting uh, seat. It's the only, only one of two non-government organizations mm -hmm. with non-voting seats in the United Nations, the other being the International Red Cross. To what degree are you duplicating what the United Nations is doing, or do you work hand in glove with each other towards the uh, uh, achievement of these six areas of focus? Well, the United Nations has their millennial goals. Okay. And these goals were developed in consultation, and Rotary was definitively part of that. Mm -hmm. Many of Rotary's goals are based on the millennial goals because these have to be um, discernible, being able to work with again in partnership. We and have measurable. To, yes, and measurable. And we have to be able to, to come to a common conclusion and not be working against each other. So yes, Rotary sits, Rotary listens, Rotary learns. Rotary also uses the contacts and the ins and the people to be able to do the work that Rotary does. And Rotary has a day at the United Nations every year, and it's usually in November sometime. Traditionally, it has been held in New York, and uh, many, 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 many hundreds of Rotarians come down, and including a large group of youth always, to spend a day and to be debriefed by the United Nations on what is happening around the world. This coming year, it is going to be held in Geneva. And it's the 11th of November, which is a fairly memorable Armistice day. Armistice Day, yes. Armistice Day, and as well, 
end of World War One. It's just over a hundred years since right. that. So it's a very it's going to be a very special day for Rotary in Geneva to celebrate that partnership. Two other uh, areas of focus for Rotary: disease prevention and treatment, and water and sanitation. And those would seem to be a little joint at the hip, if you will. Correct. Uh, maybe much more so than some of these others. Um, how how well are those efforts going? Oh, absolutely brilliantly. We have a very large um, Rotary Action Group called WASH RAG, W A S R A G. But so that is the Water and Sanitation Group of Rotary International, and um, they've had partnerships with large organizations across the world as well that focus on like USAID. And um, I would say that this is probably the area where we do our most programs and projects in is to bring clean water and sanitation to those who don't have it. Um, I, I, can, I, can I tell you a quick story? Sure, absolutely. Um, I sit on a board for a girls' school in Malawi, and um, when I was there last time, I asked to visit the schools that they draw the, the girls from. Now, I lived in Malawi for many years, but that was in the 70s, and I had not returned into that particular area since then. So going to those primary schools, I found the schools unchanged from the 1950s. The classrooms were still exactly the way they were, just four little classrooms. The brick is now exposed, the concrete floors are cracked, there are absolutely no windows, the roofs are leaking. Classrooms that were built for 35 Children are now 135 children per classroom. And we so, talk about high classroom ratios sometimes in the United States, for instance. That's outrageous. You have no idea. So you have a school with four classrooms with over 1,000 children with nine teachers. But that aside, and this is where the literacy and education part comes in, but I found at every single one of these schools, these schools a well built by an organization which was very popular within these areas. It is a well which has a pump which is driven with a roundabout. You know, the kids right. do those whirly things and they, they pump the water. Every single of where these pumps were broken, every single well was incapacitated, they were not working. So when it comes to clean water, we are not only looking at drilling the wells, providing the clean water, but teaching a community how to handle it, how to maintain it, and making it possible for them to have the funds to be able to do that and become sustainable. And that would come down to one of the other six areas, economic and community development, teaching people how to maintain healthy and sustainable communities. Uh, and not just letting it fall apart once Rotary leaves or whatever the funding agent is that leaves. A huge portion of our projects is sustainability. And sometimes even our Rotarians don't understand and why? Why do we why do we turn down a project? It's an amazing project, but it's not sustainable. Are we going to go back five, in five years' time and find that this has grown? Right. Because it needs to grow. It needs to grow either in the use or the technology or or ownership. You know the or, or everything got stolen or, and sold and stole, that sold to the black market. Exactly, right. exactly. You want to go back and find that what you did, what you left there, is is something which is being used, appreciated, but that the people in the community have learned from it as well. Another uh, of the six areas, maternal and child health. Right. Um, amazing. Um, again, um, you know, all my work that I do in Africa and in Asia, and to go into some of the health facilities and the clinics and things that I see there, how often I will walk into a small rural hospital and I will come up and I say, oh my gosh, you have, uh, you know, you, you have incubators. And on the side of an incubator sits a rotary wheel. Or the other day into an AIDS clinic that I was going into very, very rural Africa, and right on the back of it was presented by the Rotary Club of so-and-so in a great big Rotary wheel to the x-ray machines that they were using there. Everywhere, everywhere I travel in the world, there seems to be a Rotary wheel on a piece of equipment or I bump into a team of doctors or nurses or technicians busy there doing training. I bump into teams that have been brought from rural areas to here, to North America, to be trained in technology, to be trained in equipment. So yes, I think we are making a tremendous difference. The blood bank in Uganda, they've never had a blood bank before. It's just been set up by Rotary. It sounds like you need to take the Rotary logo and make it cool and hip. Oh, 
<laughs> Get I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> We've spent enough on just changing the logo exactly, to the, the new brand scheme. and with the way that it is, so I'm not going to go there now. Basic education. Well, I'm talking about branding it now. Okay, yeah, getting yeah, the word out, beating the drum yeah, relentlessly and endlessly. Yeah. Basic education and literacy. I mean, that's my, that's my uh, probably the, the most important thing, I think. If you start Absolutely. there, then a lot of these other Absolutely. things flow out of that. Yeah. I would love to know how many Rotary schools there are in the world. I mean, I personally, I personally have built five schools. Only because of Rotary, I could never ever have done it as an individual. But I personally have been involved in getting five schools built right. again into areas. Can you imagine the impact, not only for now, but this is, these are proper schools. These are not just bush schools. Right. So these right. are good education, and good education leads to good communities and growth in nation. So, no, I think it's, it's a vast area. It's being looked at, and it's certainly one of the big passions of Rotary. Well, the quick story, uh, Massachusetts had the first uh, constitution in what was then becoming the United States of America, and uh, there were several drafts of it. One was by John Adams, who went on to become a president. Uh, he taught school here in Worcester for a time uh, in his younger part of his career. And he put in there the right to a public education, and he thought it would get cut out in all of the horse trading that went on. Right. And somehow it got left in there. Oh, good. And so the Massachusetts Constitution, you have a, a constitutional right to a public education. And uh, maybe we can get that put in constitutions all around the world. Of course, you'd have to then enforce it. Well, Send in money, guns, thing. and lawyers, as Warren Zevon yeah. said. Yeah, that's the problem. When will we see a woman become president of Rotary International, whose global membership is more than 20% female, up from zero since uh, the mid-1980s? Well, considering that women have only been in Rotary since um, legally, well, well, the court case was in 86, and then it took Council on Legislation, which is our parliament, to pass the law to right. say, yes, you are allowed. So 1989, legally, when women well, were allowed. almost 30 years. It's almost 30 years, but to become a president of Rotary International, if you look at the way that um, our sort of uh, leadership growth goes, it takes around about 36 years before you have done all the things that you need to do to become a Rotary so International So all the stuff president. that people were doing as Rotary ANS, was it? No, uh, that doesn't that count. Didn't count. That doesn't count. You don't get, so you don't get credit for no, that? No, you don't get credit <laughs> oh for that. Unfortunately, <laughs> you are not a flag bearing Rotarian, right? You're only married to a Rotarian as a Rotarian. Oh my gosh. Yeah, so we're close. We are very, very close. And there are women Rotarians now who do have the necessary qualifications to make it possible. But you must remember that most of our senior positions are elected mm -hmm. positions. Um, I am one of four women members on the board of directors. That's four out of 17 this particular year. Next year, I'm alone. There's only one female director amongst the 17, but directors are elected by districts, and district governors and representatives are elected by the membership of Rotary. Then the year after, there are no women directors on the board. Of directors. Well, I just read in the Rotarian magazine the letters to the editor section. I think one of the more recent issues was just blasting Rotary for this very bad trend that's been going on for quite some time. But then you know what? I think it's up to the women too. I think that women have to put their names forward for leadership. Why, this, why don't they? Are they discouraged from well, doing it by the guys? Well, this is we come into the cultural issues of Rotary having been an old boys club for all these years. Right. It took a court case to introduce women into Rotary. It's more than 30 years now that we are allowable within Rotary, yet only 30% of our membership is female. Mm -hmm. So it's more in certain cultures and less in other cultures. It's taken 30 years for us to get to only 30% of membership within Rotary International. When, when is it going to get to the stage where we are a representative of the communities that we serve, that we're on the 50-50 basis that it should be? I think it's not that you just saying we particularly have to have women members. We have to have qualified oh, Rotarians. But yeah, when I ask the question, I'm not asking you, you just a woman look at it, having a But woman. why is it that only so few women put their names forward to Rotary? I know my my take on that. I'm a long-term woman Rotarian. I've knocked my head against the glass ceiling of the maleness of Rotary throughout it. Um, I think that young women uh, have no patience with the old boys clubs. 
And unfortunately, we have a lot of old boys clubs still out there. So we have to start looking at how do we receive women. We think we receive them well, and we think that we are completely equal. But I don't think so. I think there's still a cultural bias sometimes. So. In closing, you're here in Worcester for the Million Dollar Journey Dinner to celebrate the fact that uh, Rotary District 7910, which covers central Massachusetts and Metro West, uh, met in about six months the goal of raising at least a million dollars in donations or pledges for the Rotary Foundation. I think Rotary International gave all the other districts throughout the world two to three years to do it. Here we, we've done it in six months or so. Uh, as of this taping, May 25th, Fifth, we're up to 1.3 million. The goal is to hit 1.5 million at tonight's right. event, right. and 2 million by June 30th of 2018. The guy who's been leading the charger in that, Sacha Mitra. What, mm -hmm. what did you get to say about Sacha? Oh, Sacha is a force unto himself. When Sacha takes an idea in his head, he certainly, get certainly out of the way. does. <laughs> yeah, out he of the is way. a true ro uh, service above self. Oh, in more ways than one. More ways than one. He's a passionate. Rotarian who lives, breathes, eats the cause, cause, but really, really delivers. He's a man of action. I have a lot of respect for him. So he's one of the guys who will help get more women into the leadership position. Oh yes, he does. He absolutely does. He firmly believes in that. So there we are. Dean, how can our listeners get more information about the Rotary Foundation and Rotary International? Please go online and just look at our website. It is rotary.org. Or if you um, communicate with your local district here, um, you have funds available, I mean, um, information mm -hmm. available. Steve, you can um, perhaps give your website here right, exactly. or, or whatever contact information mm -hmm. here. But please just go to rotary.org. There's so much information that's available there. You can search on the Rotary Foundation. They will find many, many areas to look at. There are various um, forms. If you're interested, you can fill in a form and a lead will come through, which will be sent back into this area. Somebody will give you a call and perhaps they can answer your questions. And hopefully after this interview and this conversation, People who are listening will now know that Rotary is not uh, synonymous with a roundabout. Absolutely. And you know, honestly, if I can just leave you with one thought, it is this, that I could never, ever, ever have done what I am doing in my life if it wasn't because of Rotary. Rotary has made it possible for me, a very, very ordinary person, to do extraordinary things. It is a gift. Rotary is a gift. The gift that keeps on giving. It is in Rotary makes a difference. This is the uh, motto for next year. So please, if you have any feeling for humankind, join Rotary. Dean, thank you for being my guest. And thanks to our listeners for tuning into the Business Beat on 90.5 WICN, Jazz Plus for New England, and streaming at WICN.org. I'm Steve D'Agostino. I talk with Dean Roars of Rotary International about the centennial of the Rotary Foundation. To hear and download past episodes of The Business Beat, visit the podcast page at WICN.org.